Hello, and welcome to a very special webinar today. We are going to discuss the impact of women leaders with four fantastic panelists who are strong women leaders themselves. I want to thank all of our audience members that participated with us on social media uh, to help us determine what are kind of the hot topics for today's panel around women in leadership. So we appreciate your responses, and I am confident that we will cover all of those questions and uh, important data points, ideas, solutions that will really benefit individuals and organizations as we kind of close some of these really meaningless gender gaps in the workplace. So today we will be using live polling. You can participate on a mobile phone by texting your responses. To join by text, uh, simply text ZF poll to 22333. You see it on your screen and capitalization doesn't matter. Uh, you'll then receive a text message back that indicates you've joined our polling session. An alternative to texting is you can head to the link that you see, which is pollev.com slash zfpoll, and you can do that on any internet-connected device, mobile phone, tablet, or uh, open up a new browser window on your computer, and you can join polling that way. So I'm going to give everyone just a minute to join, and then we're going to do a practice poll. Our practice poll today is, what type of chocolate do you prefer? And you can see there your choices are milk chocolate, dark chocolate, or white chocolate. And so we see some folks responding. I personally love dark chocolate. Uh, but it looks like white chocolate is not really getting a lot of love out there. Okay, so uh, this should give you some practice, and uh, we're going to be using polls a few more times throughout the webinar today. So let's introduce our panelists and jump right into why we're all here. Sue Christensen is VP of Content Solutions for Zanger Folkman, and over her 20-plus year career uh, in this industry, she has really established a love for all things learning and development. We're happy to have her. Uh, Dr. Brenda Norman has been a Chief Learning Officer and has really dedicated her 25-year career to transforming learning and development in state government. Amy Pasquale, along with being a certified coach and facilitator, serves as the president and board chair of the Organization Development Network of New York, and they really focus on helping OD practitioners respond to the ever-changing world of work. And finally, Joyce Palovitz is a VP of Delivery Services for Zinger Folkman and has devoted her career to leadership development executive coaching, executive communication skills, change management, and the all-important business-to-business relationship management. So in summary, this is a great group of women. So as we shared the questions and topics from social media with the panelists, we decided to have each of them uh, come up with their own take on what they thought would be helpful. And I'm excited to see what they're going to share, and we are going to start off with Sue Christensen. Take it away, Sue. Well, thank you so much. In front of you is a question. If you will go ahead and select your gender right now, that would be great. We're going to have some fun here. Some of you may know that we are a research firm here at uh, Zenger Folkman, and so in front of you now is another question that I think will help segue into what I'd like to talk to you about today. So the question in front of you is, when I get a challenging assignment, I usually, A, begin the work cautiously to avoid mistakes, and B, is I start the work with confidence that I can do it well. And if you'll go ahead and just choose an A, a or B here, it would be interesting to see these results. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to use the previous poll um, to segment the differences between genders. At Zinger Folkman, what we've done is we have found is that in most cases, women will choose A. They will usually begin their work with caution to avoid mistakes. And men typically will choose B, um, which indicates that they are pretty confident that they can jump right in 
and do good work. This is what I'd like to talk about today with you is this idea around what we sometimes call the confidence gap. Over the years, we know that studies have consistently shown that men have higher levels of self-esteem and confidence than women. Um, the gap size itself varies, but it is definitely a reoccurring theme. I find this um, quite interesting in my experience with my own children. I happen to have a daughter and a son. And so over the years, I've had a little mini um, confidence study going on in my own home. And I wanted to share a couple of insights with you. So as a young girl, my daughter, I felt, was very, very confident. And in fact, somewhere around the age of 10 or 11, she had come to the conclusion that she was going to uh, perform in the world of theater. And one day when she was probably about 12, she hands me a piece of paper and it has a phone number on it. And I asked, said, what is this about? And she says, well, mom, I have found myself an agent. You just need to call that number and get started. And even though she went on to do great things in her chosen field, I still occasionally saw evidence that she had self-doubt. As my daughter entered her 20s, the kinds of things that I would hear from her were comments like, I'm not good at tests like that, Mom. I need to practice a lot more before I do it. Um, another one is, I think that's the answer, but I'm probably wrong. Now, I want to switch a, a second to my son. Fast forward through his teenage years, it seemed like the confidence skyrocketed. He makes the basketball team. He's a solid student. And during the time he's in, in school, he starts two little businesses. So as he entered his adult years, um, through his teenage years, I would hear things like, Mom, I got this. Um, yep, I know I'll make it. Uh, you know, I'm not sure I know what I'm talking about, but I'm going to give it a shot. So these are the kinds of things that I saw in my kids. And as time grew on, when they were into their 20s, I realized that there was a gender gap in this confidence area. At Zenger Folkman, we surveyed over 7,000 people, and we found when we're entering in our, in our mid-20s, there's a gap. Um, when we move into our 40s and 50s, we tend to equal out in our confidence levels. And then into our 60s, it actually changes. Women tend to be a little more confident than men. So as I think about this for my own children, I think, what is the impact going to be on them and their professional life? What, what will this gap that we um, see, um, how will it manifest itself in their professional lives? And I found some interesting things. Um, about this, obviously a lot of studies have been done on this, and I want to highlight a couple of findings in four of them. One is that men overestimate their abilities and performance, and women underestimate both. But the interesting thing is that their actual performances do not differ in quality. So it's interesting that confidence seems to trump competence in this, in this way. Another found that men actually apply for job or promotion when they meet only 50% of the qualifications. And women apply only when they meet 100% of the qualifications. This is a study that was an internal study done, done by Hewlett Packard. It's one that's cited often. Another interesting thing is that men initiate salary negotiations four times as often as women. And when women do negotiate, they ask for 30% less than men typically do. Another interesting study that um, I found was that when graduating students are asked what they expect to earn, female students report 20% less than male students. So as I thought about this for myself, I began to really contemplate, you know, what is it really? What is confidence really? I found a great um, definition, and it, the definition that I found is that confidence is that factor 
that turns our thoughts into judgments about our capabilities. And it's that thing that transforms our judgments into action. As I thought about this a little more, I began to think, hey, what advice could I give to my daughter um, as she enters her professional life? How could I help her bridge that gap a little bit? I believe that the advice that I would give her is to take action, that confidence is proven to be more valuable than competence. I would encourage her to take action and not wait on perfection. Um, I encouraged her to take action and own her successes and to take action and own her failures because both will propel her to take action again. And then something that's dear to my heart is I would tell her to take action and be the imperfect example that other women need to see. Recently, my daughter came to me and said, hey, I'm, you know, this little business I've been talking to you about. Um, and she's been talking to me about it for quite a while, uh, at least a year. And she made the comment to me a couple of days ago, it's not perfect yet, but I'm going for it anyway. So she actually jumped in and is moving forward. So I feel strongly that um, one thing that we as, as women can do for ourselves and also for um, those we mentor is to help bridge this gap between men and women. So I appreciate the opportunity to share that point of view. You know, what I find interesting on this topic is that it is the two-prong approach of encouraging women to take action and risks, but also for organizations to enable that risk-taking and break down barriers really so that everyone can be able to move forward without, you know, having to have that 100% of the job description met, so to speak. I also wanted to add, Jared, there's another piece of data out there that suggests that men are hired based on their potential and women are hired based on their experience. And it's interesting, um, again, how that plays into um, both the, the organization side of this issue, as well as what I feel also is this, is, is this confidence side. Women often will not even apply for positions unless they feel that they're that they've arrived there back to that 50, you know, men will go for it at 50% and women wait until they're, they've met all the criteria. So I also think, I think that that statistic plays to both sides of that equation. So I've just loved hearing the attention you paid uh, to noticing the, the difference here and how, how conscious you were of um, trying to support your daughter in a very specific way. And so I think it, it really, for me, points to clearly, you know, one mother raising two children, getting the same messages in the same context, but in some ways, the, the, obviously, the, the bigger culture that we're embedded in is transmitting mm -hmm. different messages to that, to that young man. And so you, you inter, intervened there for, for your um, daughter in a useful and a really useful way, um, and I, I think that that's beautiful and something that is vitally important for us to do. And I also wonder just about, um, you know, I think we've seen progress, or how I've seen progress in my lifetime, is that we're now all more aware of, of these dynamics going mm -hmm. on, and so we can start to talk about them amongst ourselves as women, but also with our men, and. Um, not to, to victimize or blame and say, oh, you're, you're doing this on purpose, this is so bad, um, but to really start to sensitize people to, to things that are happening unconsciously. Um, and mm -hmm. for us to all say, oh, wow, we could make a change, we could make, a di we could make this different, because I think um, we do want it to be different. You know, we say awareness is self-correcting, and um, mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. that awareness just just to be aware of and and you know what I really appreciated about what you talked about Sue was some of the um, some of the data and the research because then you can look mm -hmm. at that and you can go okay 
Yeah, it's what. Yeah, it, it, it's true. We, we have experiences with our children, and then then to see the data that kind of backs that up, and mm-hmm. uh, they say, okay, well now I'm aware of that. Um, I can I, I can now think about how I behave into that awareness. So uh, awareness is, is a good thing. What a wonderful topic. Thank you, Sue. And now let's transition to Brenda to share her thoughts. Brenda. Thanks, Jared. I am going to be talking about some methods to attract, develop, and retain women in leadership positions. There's a really strong business case for attracting and keeping women leaders in the workforce. And I'm just going to cite um, some studies that were done. Uh, one is a study conducted by Zenger Folkman um, looked at the results of over 51,000 leaders who had their leadership effectiveness evaluated. And overall, women outperformed men at each level of management, whether they were middle managers, senior management, or top management. Secondly, McKinsey research found that companies in the top quartile for gender diversity were 15% more likely to outperform those in the bottom quartile. And you can imagine that would um, result in significant um, profits. Gallup research showed that female managers are better at engaging their employees than their male counterparts. Employees who work for a female manager are six percentage points more engaged on average than those who work for a male manager. And we all know the impact of engagement, um, engaged employees, because they're involved in, enthusiastic about, and they're really committed to their work, and, and they contribute to organizations in really positive ways. When I was um, providing onboarding for new managers, I would talk about the importance of being um an advocate for your organization. And I would talk about what is it that makes your organization competitive in the workplace? So I would ask the question, what's your value proposition in selling your agency to a potential hire? Or in other words, why would a candidate with multiple offers choose to work for you? And there were so many different kinds of um, elements to take into consideration. And we discussed uh, the kinds of things that they as managers could do to uh, identify the value um, or their competitiveness as an employer. What I'd like to do is ask the participants in the audience to Um, do a word cloud with us to see how you would describe your organization's ability to attract and retain women leaders. Oh, I see some really fun responses here. Mentoring, flexibility, women's networks, Thanks for your responses. They're great. Really good at provide a lot of ideas for other people. One of the elements that uh, differentiates women from men in terms of what they look for in their careers um, is that women tend to look for intrinsic values and they want uh, a challenging job, they want developing development opportunities, they want quality feedback and autonomy, whereas men look for more extrinsic uh, elements such as uh, an increase in pay or status as being more valuable. 
Women generally don't leave the workforce because of work-life balance concerns, um, as is often perceived, but rather from a lack of career advancement opportunities. Some of the barriers that have been identified to women's career success and advancement are that women often don't feel like they fit into their organization's culture, which is often male-dominated. They also believe that they don't have enough um, actual line experience or managerial experience. Um, another barrier is that women receive less mentoring than their male counterparts, which is interesting because, as we know, women make up more than half of the workforce. Um, executive women experience more social isolation and they depend on more formal organizational career networks than the informal structures that occur in, in uh, companies. Another one is that women are more likely to be viewed stereotypically than men, and that makes it more difficult for them to access key developmental assignments. And for example, we can't assign her because um, she wouldn't be able to travel because of her family. Uh, also, there's a discrimination that occurs in geographic mobility. What we're finding is that the smart employers are really taking some innovative approaches to talent management. One of these is um, accountability at the top. And because top management is seen as the gatekeepers and the enablers of change, engagement at this level is really imperative to establish the role model and the expectations for promoting and developing women. Another element that I read about is reverse mentoring. And it was also called reciprocal mentoring. It's a great example of how to create visibility of up and coming female leaders into the top executive ranks. And it exposes women leaders to the most strategic work at the company. It really helps break down some of that unconscious bias and exposes women to those informal networks. And, and so the, the women have opportunities to interact with people that they might not do in, in an ordinary, um, work, work day. There's another one that I, um, saw that was really exciting called a buddy system. And the buddy system matches senior leaders to um, women for a year or two with the objective to build confidence, uh, create visibility of internal talent, and, and to connect these women with um, access to stretch assignments. And what's exciting about this is that the company measures the results of the coaching efforts and they hold each coach accountable for the success of the employee that they're coaching. And the results are tied to the coach's performance review and compensation. So there's some real teeth in, in that model where it's not just giving lip service. It really is um, holding people accountable. Another example I saw was that um, one company that maps out uh, careers for its employees after their first year in the company, and they're adjusted yearly. So the development plans, the stretch assignments, the promotion, networking opportunities are completely equal for men and women um, with similar capabilities. And this removes the chances of women not being aware of opportunities for their development 
And it really creates visibility again to top leadership. And um, the last item is is uh, work flexibility. And of course, we know that the variety of options for work flexibility are endless, whether they're working remotely or creating opt-out and back-in options without penalty so that women can take the time to care for family, whether it's children or, or elder care. And while these are only examples and um, they're not a prescription, and I know that uh, large employers, uh, small employers have different abilities in their opportunities to uh, provide these, these opportunities for women. I think it's the smart employer who's going to be tapping into this underutilized population uh, that's going to actually have the competitive edge. So I really appreciated the uh, the systemic approach because I think it, it 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 it's people go well. Of course, we need more women at the top, but how do we do that? And I I think the more that we can show these systemic approaches that um, actually start to change what's going on in 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 the system the better off we will be. It, it's through those kinds of things that we create the environment for people to thrive, all, all people to thrive. I saw a video floating around LinkedIn where a boy and a girl are brought into a room and they're asked to do a task together, uh, basically putting balls in these large buckets. And when they complete the task, they're given a candy reward. Uh, but the boys get significantly more candy than the girls. And what was amazing to see is that the boys instantly recognized it wasn't fair. And, you know, somewhere, as you look at this, somewhere along the line, somewhere along the way, uh, the instant recognition of these gender gaps kind of fades. And so I appreciate these kind of talent management strategies that can help close those gaps, um, bring recognition, and uh, ultimately benefit everyone in the workplace. Great. Well, that's two home runs in a row. Uh, Amy, you're up. Can we go three for three? Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Well, when I was asked to, to join today, I was initially daunted um, because this is a big topic. And one of the questions that started to form in my mind was really, how do we support women to develop their leadership potential and support an organization's ability to recognize that potential? without turning the woman or the organization into villains, victims, or defects. So there's a way that when we start to privilege one class or one group, it starts to feel like we're saying that others aren't as important and, or in some ways wrong. And so we really want to avoid that, or at least I do, because I think we can fall prey to oversimplification. And what I've found is that um, often manifests in a conversation where we're only talking about how women need to be fixed or we're only talking about how organizations or systems need to be fixed. And I think resting solely into either of those perspectives is going to limit us and inevitably leaves me feeling like we aren't really having a fruitful dialogue. So I turn to an expert on women and, and organizations um, and that's Robin Ely from the Harvard Business School. And the reason I did that is because I've, I've had the pleasure of working with Robin on a leadership project and have learned so much from her um, to, about how to support both women and organizations. And she calls it the, the both and um, kind of solution, if you will. And I'll read a quote from one of her articles that got my wheels turning. Uh, the quote is, a significant body of research shows that for women, the subtle gender bias that persists in organizations and in society disrupts the learning cycle at the heart of becoming a leader. So then that got me thinking, well, what is at the heart of this learning cycle? What is she pointing at? And, and she, she really conceptualizes that becoming a leader is at its heart an identity project. And I think this distinction really helps us decouple the development of leadership skills from the development of a leadership identity. 
And the reason this is important is because when we look at how women score on 360 assessments, um, Zinger Folkman's research uh, supports this and many other studies, women on average score higher than men. And simultaneously, women's potential as leaders goes under-recognized. So then we have to beg the question, right? So why is this? Well, in my view, this is where we have to implicate our cultural ideologies that are conveyed to all of us, men and women alike. Um, and, and really, it conveys to us what a, a leader looks like. These ide ideologies are, of course, shaped by organizational hierarchies in which men predominate, along with practices that equate leadership with behaviors believed to be more common or appropriate in men. Therefore, powerfully, if unwittingly, we communicate that women are ill-suited for leadership roles. So I'd like to focus my time on how organizations can support women and how women can support themselves in their development of an identity as a leader. And so there are really four ideas that I want to briefly touch on. The first is women leader role models. The second is anchoring into purpose. The third is creating networks. And the last is using 360 feedback to help reset perceptions. So if we start with women um, role models, uh, what's going on here? Well, simply put, we just have fewer of them. Um, and one of the ways we learn new roles is actually by seeing people in those roles and then emulating and experimenting. So a man obviously will have several different male leader role models to pick from and choose amongst a variety of behaviors and approaches and starting to find those that fit. So kind of like trying on different you know, outfits. And a woman's process is a bit delayed because she firstly is struggling to find someone um, she can model off of, a, a relate to in some way, or is, is left really trying to figure out how do I translate what I'm seeing in a man to myself? So then we have to think, well, what can an organization do? What can women do about this? The answer, in my view, is pretty straightforward. Organizations need to be much more intentional about promoting and making visible women um, in terms of leaders, both in their organization and outside of them. So when you're bringing a panelist in or when you're bringing um, different facilitators or trainers in, when you're bringing in people that have some kind of gravitas, um, paying attention to the gender dynamics there. And I think that there have been efforts, um, or I've seen efforts being made on that front. And for women, we have to be actively pursuing role models, and if they're not in our organization, pursuing them outside of our organization. And I think we've seen a lot of examples of women's networks springing up to help provide um, that resource for women. And then women leaders need to really recognize that you're a role model and you can make yourself visible and you can think about ways that you can and do serve as a role model for others. So on this note, I'd like to engage you via a word cloud. So what I'd like to know is this. What word would describe how you've approached being a role model for other women leaders? Just give you a moment to think about that. Type in your answers. All right. I'm seeing some, some answers that I uh, imagined might happen. Um, things like, I've never considered this. Um, I'm a little tentative to do this. Um, I'm doing this actively. Excellent. It's great to see all of, all of these responses coming in, and thank you for taking a little bit of time to reflect on that. I hope that's given you some food for thought as you've, as you've, as you've taken the inventory for yourself and what you might do as a next step in this area. So let's move into this idea of anchoring into purpose. And what I really like about this concept for me is that this isn't something that I had really considered before as having a gender element. So I, I'm a big believer that all of us need to um, find purpose, and I think a lot of research supports that. But when we look at it for women, what anchoring into purpose does for us is allow us to, in some ways, redirect our energies away from um, high monitoring of self 
um, paying a lot of attention to how different people are seeing us and um, just diverting our inner our energy and focus because we're all aware that there is a little bit of a double bind or a trade-off that women are often making either consciously or unconsciously and that's this this trade-off between likability and competence and that requires a lot of energy to always be paying attention to that and, and attending to it additionally women as they rise become more visible because they're more scarce and what can happen with this is a heightened level of scrutiny or feeling of being scrutinized and that can lead to, to risk aversion and micromanagement again to keep oneself safe that's what all these behaviors are designed to do and so we can combat this high self-monitoring and risk aversion by helping women stay focused on being grounded in their purpose and this can um, in some ways uh, serve as a way to define themselves, measure themselves, and help them choose behaviors that support moving in that direction. So I'm really, I'm really excited about that because I can really see the power of that mindset shift and how it can help um, divert um, energy in a more um, productive way. So the next thing, of course, we need to talk about is networking because what professional hasn't heard about this? And we all on some level know how important this is and it's critically important for women and there are really three reasons. First, we have to acknowledge that there are simply systemic differences in men's and women's um, formal organizational positions. This, together with people's preferences to interact with others of the same sex, yield dramatic differences in the composition and structure of men's and women's networks. So in settings where men predominate in, in positions of power, women have a smaller pool of high status, same gender contacts on which to draw and fewer ties to powerful high status men. So that's the reality of it. Men and women also use their, their networks differently. So men's networks are mostly men and multi-purpose. So they're social, they're strategic, they're business oriented, whereas women tend to build more functionally differentiated networks, obtaining instrumental access from men because that's where the power resides, and friendship and social support from women. Um, additionally, women may feel reluctant to undertake some of the quote-unquote instrumental activities required to build strong networks, fearing these activities appear inauthentic or um, somehow manipulative. So, well, what can we do about this? Well, we're going to go back to this idea of anchoring into purpose. Because again, what this can do is start to give women a sense that, aha, this is why I'm doing this. This is why it's really beneficial for me to act in this more instrumental way because it's actually serving this higher purpose. It's not just serving me. It's not being manipulative. It's not being inauthentic. Additionally, from an organizational perspective, I think what we can really do is start to offer women-only training sessions to, to just simply educate women about how they're approaching networking differently and how um, than men, the consequences of that, and then um, developing some strategies around that. So lastly, I'd love to talk to you about 360 data, and I was just so jazzed to see this in, in Robin's research because Certainly, I spend a lot of time with Zenger Folkman talking with people about their 360 data. And so what's going on here is women in the world of organizations typically receive less uh, critical feedback um, than men. So they're not as attuned to what's really going on or the perceptions that people hold about them. Um, feedback, of course, is more comprehensive than other types of feedback, so it gives us a better picture of what's really going on. And lastly, when we look at, at uh, women's 360s, often the likability competence dichotomy or bind starts to show up and it, and it can make it difficult for women to figure their way out of that. So there's two things that we can start to do here. The first is for women, we can use this strategically to engage in the discussion with our peers, with our direct reports, with our bosses to say, hey, here's how I'm doing, and really connect their competency to their leadership credibility. So it starts to shape people's perception. And certainly, we talk about this within our Zanger Folkman research, that you want to involve others in your development. And so this is a way to actually shape people's impressions. 
And then from an organizational perspective, we need to be mindfully um, attending to the feedback debrief process with qualified coaches. And this just isn't uh, an advertisement for the services that, that Zanger Folkman and I provide. But it, it's really important that um, women can start to see perhaps some of the trade-offs they've made between the likability and competence and get them to see that they don't have to make that. Um, there may be uh, a useful way that they can include both. And so that's what I had prepared today to just give you a little bit of a, a bird's eye view of, of some key ways we can help women and organizations support women in developing their leadership identities. I think we did it. Three home runs. <laughs> I really appreciate the idea that you shared around women leaders recognizing uh, that they are a role model. Um, and I don't think, you know, you have to be an executive or a senior leader to be a role model. There are a lot of ways uh, that women can act as role models for others. And, and so really thinking about that, uh, I think is a great idea. Yeah. Thank you. All right, Joyce, bases are loaded. Are you ready to hit the grand slam? <laughs> <laughs> No small task there, Jared. Um, so as I listened to my colleagues here, and I'm so appreciative of the, the, the variety of viewpoints that have come through, um, we've certainly got some systemic work to do. And I think Brenda touched on that with a lot of, of what she was talking about. Sue touched on that. Amy, everybody touched on that. Um, and I and I agree with all of that. I, I I really do. I came into the workplace in the in the mid mid 1970s. I didn't have any role models. Um, I was just kind of making my way as best as I could. And I, I I'm not sure why this happened or how it happened, but I have found myself along through my career often being the first woman in a certain position or the first person to sit around a table and often sitting around a table with all of my colleagues would be male. Um, and it's really, um, uh, it, it's, it's kind of daunting to think about, well, how, how do you, how do you work in that? But, but we have to do it. I mean, we have to just keep going forward and moving forward. And, and sometimes the systemic stuff is not in our control. So although I didn't realize this was what was going on, I saw a model along the way that really um, resonated with me. And we're going to show it to you now. It's called the CPO model. And this model is about how do we thrive in leadership? And when I saw it, I thought, ah, now I can understand how to control what I can control. I can't always control everything, but how can I control as much as possible to help myself thrive? And the model is simply, how can I learn what I'm most competent at? And this is where Amy's talk about the 360 uh, feedback and everything that I learn about myself, how can I learn what I'm most competent at? And then this idea of what Brenda was talking about, intrinsic and even extrinsic values, passion, what kinds of things provide meaning for me? And then finally, orienting myself to becoming uh, a leader who is very focused on what the organization needs. And, and and this is true for both men and women, truly. And and both men and women deserve the opportunity to thrive. But I think women have particular skill sets and orientations that help them tap into this. And this, for me, Amy, is actually the heart of being a leader. I think about where is the heart of being a leader in where is my identity? It's owning myself in these ways. Uh, and being able to talk about my competence and say, here's what I'm good at. Here's how I can help the organization achieve what it needs to achieve. Um, so I, I really think that this model is a way for us 
from the stuff that's in our control to control how we show up as leaders. So let's just stop here for a moment and ask you to reflect. Uh, when was the last time you felt you were truly thriving professionally? Was it within the last year? Would you say it's been more like in the last two to three years? Or would you say, whoa, it's been a long time since I felt I was thriving? So just take a few moments, uh, answer the poll, and we'll show you the results here in a moment when we give everybody a chance to answer. So the good news is some people have felt that they've been thriving recently, and that's, and that's great. And I guess what I would say to just challenge us all is if I, if, if I can't say it's been pretty recently, then how do I pull myself uh, back into a, a thriving position? And the CPO model, the Competence, Passion, Organizational Needs model, is a, is a guideline to help us do that. And I guess what I would say um, in conclusion is that if there's if, the, if, there, if there's one kind of overarching purpose that drives not only me but pretty much everybody on this phone call and everybody at Zinger Fogman, it's that we believe we truly believe that any leader can be extraordinary, and and so. If we truly believe that, then our, our work becomes about how do we help organizations tap into all of that talent that's out there, and how do we help people thrive? Because when we do that, when we help people thrive, not only do people grow and develop and become their best selves, but the organizations they work for become the best manifestation of what that organization can be. So I would just say, think on this model and and think on everything else that we've talked about today. And, and let's commit ourselves or recommit ourselves to helping ourselves thrive, to being a role model to help others thrive, and to thinking about systemically, how do we help our organizations thrive? I really believe that this is what it's all about, helping everyone to thrive. And we do believe uh, at Zanger Folkman that everyone can be an extraordinary leader and that organizations and the people in them will greatly benefit from finding ways in which they leverage the talent and potential of women leaders. So thank you to all our panelists and thank you to our audience. We have a great a piece of content for you to download after this webinar. Uh, it's a beautiful uh, designed digital design, and in it we present five profound reasons why organizations need to repair their talent pipelines and take advantage of this largely untapped and unrecognized resource for leadership, and that's women. So look for that link in our follow-up email and go download that. Uh, also, don't forget to register for our next webinar, The Key to Unlocking Your Career Highs Again and Again. Uh, and thank you for spending some time with us today.